Acho que começou. Posso falar aqui? Não. É que isso começou já. Já está direto. Não, espera um pouco. É. Acho que as pessoas estão entrando, né? Olá pessoal, bem-vindos a essa live é, do Latas FIP, o Laboratório de Teoria Social, Filosofia e Psicanálise, hoje debatendo Ciência e Ficção em Freud, é, o livro de Isabel Alfandari. Oi gente, então com a gente vai estar o professor Vladimir Safatli, o professor Nelson da Silva Júnior, And uh, it's a pleasure, Madame Alfandri, uh, to discuss your book. Let's start your, our conversation. Okay. Então, uh, eu faço a apresentação e eu passo a palavra à Isabel. Né? Uh -huh. uh, Madame Alfandri, para a gente é uma grande felicidade ter esse debate conosco, dentro de uma proposta que nós havíamos desenvolvido no começo do ano, de discutir livros uh, que nos pareciam fundamentais, dentro da relação entre teoria social, filosofia e psicanálise. Né? Então, Isabela Alfandari ela é psicanalista, ela é também professora de literatura anglo-saxã, Universidade de Paris 3, ela é uma das grandes especialistas, especialmente de Derrida, né? inclusive com livros importantes sobre a relação entre Lacan e Derrida, que eu, eu recomendo vivamente. Né? Então, alguém que tem uma longa uh, reflexão, uma longa tradição de pesquisa no interior das relações entre filosofia e psicanálise, e, foi, e é também ex-presidente do Colégio Internacional de Filosofia de Paris. Né? Uh, esse livro tá, foi traduzido agora pela editora Blücher, né? e pode ser encontrado, então, uh, já à disposição, nas, como se diz normalmente, nas melhores livrarias do ramo. Né? Então, uh, eu vou passar diretamente a palavra à professora Alfandari, que vai, então, fazer uma pequena apresentação do seu livro em inglês, né? E aí a gente vai também fazer uma discussão sobre o livro e depois eu convido a todos aqueles que estiverem nos acompanhando também enviem suas questões, façam suas perguntas, que a gente vai também poder ler essas perguntas aqui. Well, uh, Isabela, uh, well, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for this invitation. I'm very honored to be with you today. I'd like to make a very brief, um, um, should I say, summary or revisitation of my book, just to introduce a few topics that we may um, be able to discuss uh, later um, in, in the debate. So the book is called Science and Fiction in Freud, uh, What Epistemology for Psychoanalysis My intention originally, as I was working on the different styles of Freud, um, I was giving a seminar at the Collège International de Philosophie, and I was interesting, I was struck from the very beginning of my uh, Freud readings by the fact that Freud is, is, of course, the founder of psychoanalysis, but also the author of many different styles and writing formats. I was interested that in the fact that Freud did not only write in one way, in a sense, according to one single format, but that he resorted to many different styles. And that's how it all began for me. I realized, I soon realized that these styles in Freud had nothing to do with Freud's pleasure of writing, even though it may not be totally lacking in Freud, but that there were epistemological reasons for these different styles, that Freud would, um, for instance, write case studies and at some point um, renounce, relinquish the writing of case studies to move on to yet a different form of writing. He, uh, at some point, resorted, um, I mean, simultaneously to different, different, um, um, I mean, genres of writing, which I understood to actually manifest um, um, or, or, or 
respond to very specific clinical and epistemological problems. So that's how it all started. And what I realized going back to the very first essays by Freud, studies on hysteria, what I realized reading the first Freud, if you want, is that the question of scientificity and the question of science was absolutely crucial in the very beginnings of Freud's discovery of psychoanalysis, but also throughout his work. The fact that Freud would never, in a sense, renounce the founding of a science, the founding of psychoanalysis as science, I found very interesting and also very intriguing because as I'm sure you all know, Freud wanted at the very beginning psychoanalysis to be founded as a science of nature, like chemistry or physics. He wanted in the Aufklärung tradition to found psychoanalysis as not only a science, but as a science of nature. And this, of course, he did not manage to do. He, he soon realized, at some point realized, that he could not reach his goal. And yet he went on, he remained with this reference to scientificity that he would never relinquish. I'm um, all the more interested in this, um, I mean, um, necessity for psychoanalysis to be referred to sci science and scientificity that Lacan himself uh, understood very well, much later uh, in the century, Freud's decision and, and necessity to stick with science. And I'm not sure how this question of science and scientificity in Freud is um, addressed um, in Brazil, but certainly among French um, psychoanalysts, it is, I don't think, a major issue, which I found myself to be quite an intriguing and tricky issue. Now, um, what I'm trying to address is the, in this book is first um, what I would call the, the successive states of, um, uh, of Freudian epistemology. I try to readdress the different modes in which Freud tried to uh, found psychoanalysis as a science and the limits, of course, that he soon encountered. One limit was the limit of the case study um, writing because he, want, he really relied very early on on the writing of, of case studies. And after uh, The Wolfman, of course, he began with the very early cases of studies on hysteria. And with The Wolfman, he at some point ended, in a sense, reaching the limit of what I would call um, credulity or, or um, um, of, um, um, I mean, uh, faith. He reached the limits of, say, the, the, the capacity for, um, for, for the analyst, for the writing analyst, discoverer of, of psychoanalysis and the unconscious, to uh, make a point, to prove his point. Now, um, what I, so it's, it's difficult to summarize in just in a few minutes, but I was struck also by another, should I say, fact, not only that psychoanalysis uh, Freud wanted to found as a science, but that Freud um, in 1915, in an article part of his unpublished Metapsychology, said that he had all the clinical uh, um, evidence and proof of his theory, but of uh, and of his um, of the of the unconscious, that that he would stick with the unconscious as hypothesis. He would never call the unconscious thesis or concept, but hypothesis. And this also struck me. Uh, why would Freud in this 1915 um, I mean, chapter of his unpublished uh, Metapsychology say that he had all clinical proof of what he was saying and yet not, um, I mean, not, not conclude that the, the hypothesis of the, of, of the unconscious could be treated as thesis. And this has, I think, to do with the fact that Freud very well understood being also part of this Aufklärung tradition that if he wanted psychoanalysis to be founded as science, he could not um, come up with, um, uh, with the unconscious as a thing or with the unconscious as um, even as, as thesis for the very good reason that no one, no psychoanalyst in this world has ever met the unconscious, has ever in a sense um, be able to address uh, the unconscious as phenomenon. By definition, the unconscious for Freud remains an, um, an inferred necessity but neither a thing, a ding, 
um, a new man, if you like, nor, of course, a phenomenon. Of course, there are all kinds of clinical indirect manifestations of the unconscious, a uh, slip of the tongue, the dream, of course. There are all kinds of manifestation that Freud treats as evidence, absolute evidence of what he's uh, saying, but there is no direct address of the unconscious. So Freud came up with some form of what I called an epistemological compromise, where he wanted psychoanalysis to be founded as science. And at the very same time, he could not rely on the unconscious as neither thing, of course, nor phenomenon, and had to come up with this, um, I mean, um, compromised, um, in all the meanings of the term, by the way, compromised notion of hypothesis of the unconscious. So the unconscious throughout Freud's career will be treated as hypothesis. And this, I think, has um, quite a few, um, I mean, clinical consequences. If an analyst works with the unconscious as thesis, it's certainly very different from an, an analyst working with the unconscious as mere hypothesis, but maybe in the discussion we may want to come back to this uh, question or difference. And so I very soon found out, and maybe that's the third, um, um, I mean, the, the third, uh, say, thing that really intrigued me working on, the, on, on Freud's text, soon found out that there was yet a third intriguing fact in Freud. One, again, was the fact that he, um, I mean, kept wanting to found analysis as science, the other second, um, second intriguing fact was the fact that he would keep, uh, I mean, he would stick to um, the unconscious as hypothesis. And the third uh, intriguing fact in a sense, even though it's less manifest a fact, is the fact that Freud needed what I call a third term to, uh, I mean, to make the whole, um, his whole theory in a sense consist. And he needed a third term that he would hardly ever use, but that I see that I tend to read as fiction. Fiction is hardly ever is a term hardly ever used in Freud's text. I mean, not not hardly ever, but very um, uncommonly, not very often used in Freud. And yet, because Freud, of course, is a is a major literary reader, an admirer of Goethe of, of 19th century um, literature. But Freud very clearly distinguishes himself from any kind of literary work and especially distinguishes himself very clearly in Moses um, and monotheism from any sense of fiction. Fiction is only I mean, concerned with imagination, the imag literary imagination, and by definition contradicts the idea of psychoanalysis as science. And yet, as I tried to show, Fiction plays, I mean, fiction is paradigm, so I don't mean, of course, literary fiction or literature, but fiction is paradigm and different valences or versions of what you might want to call the paradigm of fiction operates very decisively in, in Freud's theory. Um, I, for instance, took a look at the very early um, cases, case studies by Freud, to discover that the detective model that the detective story model played, a, 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 I mean, a crucial, very decisive role in the studies on hysteria by Freud. Freud, in a sense, the analyst, the first analyst to be, very much behaves and, and, and talks like um, uh, Conan Doyle and or Dupin in Poe's story. So it's not as if fiction played no role. Same thing with um, um, the, 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 the anthropological um, um, text by Freud, uh, which are based on what I would tend to call heuristic fictions, uh, the murder, namely the murder of the, the father of the herd in Totem and Tabu, and the murder of Moses in Moses and Monotheism, myth, um, scientific myth, as Freud will call them, that play a decisive, crucial role, operating role in his, in the foundation of his theory, and that can be related to uh, the, the um, concept of fiction that I try to come up with. So in other terms, um, I tend to go back, I, I tend to look at Freud's theory and also clinic, uh, reintroducing a suppressed term, a suppressed paradigm or suppressed term that um, accounts for an operating paradigm, that is to say the necessity uh, of a third term, of a mediator, that fiction turns out uh, to be. Just to 
maybe summarize the, the very argument of the book. Maybe I'll leave it at that for the discussion to begin. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Isabel. Um, I will just uh, start the discussion. I don't know who would like to start. Nelson, Christian, do you have questions? Should, should I go? Okay. okay. You want to go, Nelson? Yes, well, let's do it. Okay. okay, Nelson, Christian, and then I have a question to you. Okay. I will have to switch a language because I was preparing all, <laughs> all what I had to say in French. But let's see. If you don't understand, I, I can change to French. It will be easier for me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, I, I found your book very, very interesting. And in many points, it's, it gets close to, to my own interests. I, my thesis in Paris 7 was about a, a Portuguese writer called Fernando Pessoa. And in fact, it, it is uh, an essay about fiction, the fictionality of Freudian reading and writing. So there, there are some close points. It's a subject that I like very much. Well, uh, one thing that uh, I totally agree with you, is that Freud uh, tried all his life long, his working life long, to, to stick to the scientific, to, to science. And he states that many times along his writings, and that's, that's what the official presentation of psychoanalysis he would like to, to, to do. But there are at least two points where this official presentation don't really fit the scientific uh, perspective. And one is, as you put it very, very precisely, is, is the clinical experience. Why? Because, as, as he says, and you, you quote you it, uh, the material he worked it in clinic was already um, a fictional material. And there we have a point uh, where I think your book is very, very good on it uh, to, to point out all the problems Freud had to, to, to put some science in that <laughs> clinical material to uh, reintroduce science in that material. The other problem was in, as you put it very clearly too, was in his theoretical constructions. Why? Some of his theoretical constructions go very well with scientific paradigms, but others don't. Let's just take as uh, an example death drive, who, which states that there is a, a, a tree, a, a, a movement which comes from the living being and goes to a point uh, of, the, of what there is no register in its living being. There is a contradiction which is not, cannot fit in the idea of scientific causality. Oh, this is an example. Well, all that um, drags us to a problem of distinction between what, what Aristotle put, put it out in his poetics, uh, the distinction between truth and various similes. Let's take la vraisemblance, c'est-à-dire uh, very similitude, very similitude. The problem is that uh, either in his clinical experience or in his theoretical essays, this distinction cannot be stated one, one and for all. 
there is an undecidability in his experience and also in his construction. Can I, I dare you put forward a very another very interesting function of fiction, which cannot be fit, which doesn't fit in his project of fraud, is his use of fiction. His, his use of fiction, and, and then I would like to, to hear you about, about more about a text that you just mentioned in your book, is Constructions in Psychoanalysis. Uh, why? Because there we can, we can testify a Freud that uses fiction as a clinical tool. He, he makes a construction, he presents a construction, but differently from what he did in, in the Wolfsman, in the, the case of Lomolu, Lecao de Lomolu, he waits waits for something. He doesn't cause, he doesn't uh, demand uh, the conviction of the patient. He waits for his unconscious reactions. And he waits for a whole uh, transformation process in the economic point of view, in the economic dynamics of his patients, and this is this is something that has always um, made made me question about the place of fiction in Freud. This, what do you think, Isabella Frondari? Do you think that this last one of his last uses of fiction? Uh, what would you say in the if you follow your book? <laughs> Until that point of the use, the clinical, this use, clinical use of fiction, what you would you say comparing it to the Wolfsman and, and the other, on the other cases? Okay, that's it. I would like very much. Thank you very much for the reading of your. Thank you so much for your question um, and, and comment. I will first say that I absolutely agree with, the, with, with your reference to Aristotle's poetics um, and the opposition, the distinction that Aristotle makes between truth and verisimilitude. And that Poyain, Poiesis, is on the side of the creation of verisimilitude. I think in Freud, and what I wanted to say, that I find this distinction very apt when applied to Freud, because of course, Freud failed, maybe I should say this more clearly, failed in his attempt to found uh, a science, to, find, to found psychoanalysis as a science. But what was intriguing and interesting to me is Freud's um, renewed wish, desire, decision, should I say, to stick to scientificity, even though he knew he failed to um, come up with a body, with a theoretical body that would be even nearing, even come near what he's called science um, in his times. So it's this um, decision, should I call this decision, to stick to this, uh, even though he knew he failed. And I think there are reasons. It's not only because Freud was, in a sense, fantasizing science. Probably he was very impressed by science. He was, to that extent, as I understand it, an Aufklärung man. And so he was impressed by post-Kantian um, science, by, by the, um, say, the certainty of, of, um, um, of, of science, how science could prove, in a sense, the real uh, right, uh, and how the real could be proved right by science. So I think there was, a, 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 um, there was science, Freud was certainly impressed by, by, by the strength, by, by the phallic strengths of sciences. There's no question. But I think it's much more than just this, just his being impressed by what science meant. I think he very clearly and very early understood if that if he didn't come with a theoretical body, um, um, a meta psychology, 
and maybe we'll come back to this term and discuss discuss this term a little later because it's crucial also in Freud's um, um, own foundation of psychoanalysis. Um, and knowing that psychoanalysis was based on, should I say, the dream and transference, very elusive of phenomena, hardly phenomena. If you had, in a sense, to believe in transference, if you could believe in transference without any scientific reference, analysis would be yet another cult. Analysis would be yet another religion, a new religion. And Freud, I think, wanted to avoid the possibility for analysis to be an object of cult or to be an object of faith. In other words, transference should never be an object of faith and no analysis can never say without being in a sense contradicted that he believes in analysis. Because an analyst saying that he believes in analysis would be a major danger to any of his analysis, I'm pretty sure. So I think the, 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 the fact that Freud stuck with, with this reference throughout his life, even though he failed to found psychoanalysis as science, is still very, um, I guess, uh, decisive in, his, in, in, the, in the foundation of psychoanalysis. So yes, you're absolutely right. Um, one text that I mentioned by the end of my um, essay is Construction in Psychoanalysis. It's a text, it's a very late text in, 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 in Freud's work. It's also a text that I see as a counterpoint, as a clinical counterpoint to the writing of Moses and Monotheism. And, and I think you should read the two together, in a sense, because in both cases, one addresses constructions and analysis addresses the clinical, of course, side, and Moses more, should I say, um, um, anthropological and or metapsychological uh, side of the same phenomenon. Because in both texts, late texts in Freud's career, Freud addresses the question of repressed traces or repressed memories, memories that can never be dug out in a sense. And the, 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 the thing you were mentioning, the, your question, if I understood it well, had to do with constructions. But when are constructions necessary for Freud? In one single case, in a sense, constructions are necessary whenever the repressed memory is sure never to come up is almost sure never to surface. Same thing with Moses and monotheism. The, the, the demise, the, the, the murder of the, of, 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 of the prophet can never in a sense surface. So you have, but you have to deduce it and you have to come up with a theory. And in a sense, Freud in Moses, Moses and monotheism comes up with a construction, I mean, given to the Jewish people. At least that's how I understand it. He gives the, the Jews in analysis, should I call them so, a construction that they can never come up with, a, a construction corresponding to a repressed memory that can never surface or resurface. Same thing with constructions. But I think what's in, what is interesting in constructions and analysis is that the valence, the, the, I mean, the, 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 um, the nature of fiction in this case is a construction. And a construction is something different from the as if model that Freud uses in other instances of his work. Because a construction is not exact is, is not any mode of fiction. A construction is has to do with the term of very similitude that you used earlier on. It's an it's an almost necessary link, missing link that he will provide the patient with. He will wait till the possibility of this construction is, is possible. It's possible to, to, in a sense, to, to hand it in to the patient. And it's never very clear whether the patient, in advance, whether the patient will be able to, in a sense, um, accept it, incorporate it, or whether he will reject it. So I think you're absolutely right. I think fiction is absolutely central to constructions in psychoanalysis. And I think the, the final version of fiction for Freud is that of construction. That is to say, a necessary, um, um, an, should I say, a necessary setup or a, nece or a missing bond, a missing element, um, because in most cases, and the, the, um, the example that Freud uses in constructions and analysis, of course, is in Oedipal construction. Yes. that he will, um, he will provide his patient with. 
Um, and it's a very, for us, it's a very banal, should I say, construction that he, the example that he gives to tell his patient that when he was two years old, he became very jealous of his brother or just uh, born sister or brother. Uh, but anyway, I find interesting that you're absolutely right that the final version of fictions in, in Freud's work should have to do with the construction of, um, um, of a setup or the transmission of a necessary um, hypothesis in a sense, a hypothesis that has everything to do with what uh, Aristotle would call verisimilitude, something that is necessary, that is logical, that could not be but what it is. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. Uh, yes, it's, it's a pleasure to hear you. And what interested me in this text uh, relating to your text was is that, um, well, I put it as a question to you. Would you, so, would you go so far to say that in this text, Freud found a way to relate fiction to empirical proof differently. Why I say that? Because, well, he he waits for an unconscious reaction. He is not interested anymore in the agreement, the conviction of his patients. He, took, he takes as a proof, even if his patients go worse, this is very interesting. If they, if they go worse, then he's right. <laughs> well, uh, well, it's an extreme position, okay? It's ironic, but I think there is logic, logic in this kind of reasoning. And, and this very, in this last step of Freud, in his relation to, to fiction and proof, uh, I think is very interesting and, and it goes very close to your reasoning. I think very, it goes in the direction of your, of your research. Question. I think it's very well formulated. Thank you for the formulation, which is very helpful. I think you're absolutely right that in this final version of fiction in Freud, um, Freud comes up with a, a value or valence or a version of fiction where fiction has to do with what you just called empirical proof, but also with what I would call clinical tool to take up a word that you used just before, because it turns out to be at the very same time a clinical tool because it is meant also to operate on the patient in the cure. It's not only meant to restore the truth, the missing bond that will, I mean, allow the patient, enable the patient to, to finally uh, understand the truth of his, of his story, but is the, the, of course the, the providing of such, um, of such a fiction, of such an empirical reconstitution or construction also is meant to operate on the patient. And I think this is the reason why Freud will take everything for proof of the validity of, and it's, of course, it begins with the joke. Huh? I, I don't remember exactly how it's, how it's, it, 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 I mean, it's, it's formulated in English, but in French is, uh, pile, tu gagnes, face tu gagnes, heads and tails you win. You always win yes. as a psychoanalyst. Yes. Freud making fun of himself. But in a sense where he is right, where he is, where he, is necessarily right, I guess, is that he comes up with a, a, a version of fiction where fiction both is tool and proof. Proof of the theory of the unconscious, of the hypothesis of the unconscious that he will not call thesis, and, and tool, operating tool, in order to, in a sense, um, um, process the unconscious articulate the unconscious or, or spark something, trigger something that yes. will necessarily result in an unconscious manifestation. And, and uh, yeah, I'm also fascinated by, by the fact that any manifestation will be taken for, for, for I mean, will, will necessarily uh, prove the validity of, of the construction. Of course, it's logically questioning, but, um, but um, addressing um, 
addressing the question from the perspective of transference, of course, it makes a different, you, you would make a different reading of it. But yes, absolutely. I think it's fiction as empirical proof and clinical tool. I'm not sure, by the way, whether contemporary psychoanalysts practice construct construction so much. Um, this is also a question. I'm not sure. I mean, it may be the case that sometimes a construction is necessary, but it's also extremely, I mean, you should be always very cautious with your constructions, of course. Um, also because of the, of the clinical tool that it implies. Yes, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Nelson. Uh, ben, uh, ask a question to make your question. Yeah. Uh, I would like to, to express my gratitude for, for your book, Maison Fondry. It was a pleasure to read it. It is very well positioned in, in, in Brazilian uh, contemporary debates around psychoanalysis. And especially, it comes in a in a very good moment uh, because we are we are discussing uh, which which is the proper relation between Lacan and Freud uh, when we consider epistemology, uh, when we consider reference to science, and we we have some positions that are saying uh, we we have to cut we have to cut the relation between Freud and Lacan because they both uh, operate in completely different epistemologies. Uh, I don't agree with this position, and I think e your book is uh, uh, very clear evidence uh, against this separation. And so my commentary is, is addressing uh, things uh, around this debate. Um, the first thing is, uh, uh, as far as ca I can understand your explanation, you, your strategy is, is to localize relations between Freud and science and fiction, uh, focusing on three main uh, concepts, uh, evidence, uh, certainty, and truth. The certainty is include all your uh, very good uh, and very convincing uh, explanation about uh, the semantics of Glauben uh, in, 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 in German and how it operates uh, in a kind of a mixing between certainty and evidence. Uh, and these three uh, concepts uh, they have uh, uh, the force, the power, uh, to be strong enough to uh, discuss with contemporary epistemology. Yeah? No, no scientist uh, will give up uh, uh, the concepts, uh, the concept of evidence uh, and the concept of certainty, the, the beliefs in, in the Anglo-Saxon uh, tradition, and the concept of truth. Uh, the COVID. Uh, make a point, a uh, very strong point against uh, uh, some, some uh, loose uh, relativist uh, philosophies of science and so on. So we, we are back uh, to kind of uh, adjustment in, in, in psychoanalysis and science debate. Uh, I completely agree. Uh, with your, your archaeology of uh, the scientific uh, position in Freud, uh, how Freud positioned psychoanalysis in a, in a scientific Weltanschauung, uh, how uh, Freud uh, do not resign to stay in science, even uh, though he was a bad epistemologist uh, of his, himself. And he, you made that point uh, as well. Uh, my, my first consideration, uh, my approxima uh, approximative consider uh, uh, question is, uh, you are dismantling this um, easy opposition between, between science as such and hermeneutics. You're not, uh, as far as I can understand your, your point, you're not saying psychoanalysis, it's uh, simply uh, uh, an extension of the myths uh, he is uh, creating to un understand uh, the suffering of uh, the analysis. Um, so uh, I think it's, it's a good way uh, to suspend this easy 
distinction between hermeneutics of science. Because uh, in your argumentation, uh, we were uh, invited to consider radically uh, the concept of hypothesis. What is a hypothesis? And a hypothesis belongs, as far as I can understand in your, in your argument, a uh, hypothesis is a kind of a, a particular case of a fiction. So fiction is a broader field uh, when science and uh, use of uh, this uh, concept of hypothesis is uh, restrictly used. Uh, use uh, combined with, uh, with some ex uh, exigence, but uh, uh, we are not going to discuss that uh, the concept of hypothesis comes from fiction. Comes from you. You have fiction and myth, uh, and you have hypothesis myth. You have fiction and science, and uh, you have uh, the use of uh, hypothesis in in, in science. Um, this uh, make a kind of nachträglichkeit uh, to your two main genders you you distinguish in Freud: the clinical gender and the pedagogical gender. Uh, I think your book is, is very, very uh, clever uh, to make this distinction and to dissolve this distinction uh, as far as uh, it, 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 uh, it goes. Because uh, at the end, I think we have to uh, make the point of the credulity that the clinical cases uh, bring uh, to, to us. But uh, you have to uh, to oppose and uh, to dialectize di uh, this kind of credulity with concepts, with uh, pedagogical concepts, with a hypothesis of metapsychology, and so on. So, your book, uh, I read it, is a kind of a investigation around what, uh, which kind of hypothesis, which kind of a uh, um, uh, combination uh, between uh, truth, uh, certainty, and evidence we have, and the use of hypothesis in in uh, in Freud. And uh, here we can we I have a second uh, question around the use of Kant, because uh, the idea that Freud is using analogies of experience as a kind of a schema, as a kind of a, of a, a of a way of dealing with the hypothesis is uh, very ad adopted by uh, some epistemologies, uh, ep epistemologists of psychoanalysis. Freud is Kantian, so he's importing concepts from Kant. What he's saying about science depends on Kant. Uh, the Ding an sich depends on Kant, uh, and so weiter. Uh, but if you read, as you 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 make uh, Freud in 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 a short distance, you see he's using uh, bad Kant. He's not properly rigorous <laughs> in this transportation from from Kantian analogies of experience to uh, anal anthropological analogies, historical analogies, and and so on. So we can defend uh, the, the the bad Freud and Kant as uh, the better we have in terms of uh, uh, the survival of his uh, own epistemology. And uh, now uh, I, I, I present you an, another question. Uh, this bad Kantian Freud uh, is uh, the, the nucleus of this uh, slip Philosophical slip, I would uh, I would say, is history, the theory of history that Kant uh, do not have, and Freud begins to to get deeper and deeper, uh, as far as uh, in some some delirious moment he he wondered that uh, psychoanalysis could could found history as a as a science, uh, as a uh, kind of a meta science. And uh, this is, in some sense, very contemporary. Uh, when we when we we take into account arguments from Ian Hacking, for example, uh, when we take into account uh, some Foucaultian region uh, readers of psychoanalysis, when we take into account the idea that. Uh, 
there's something wrong with the epistemology in, in Freud, but maybe uh, he was correct in ontology. This, this, uh, this wrongness of Freud is, is uh, 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 a correct direction when we uh, look to science and ask those days, which kind of ontology are you accepting to make hypothesis? Which kind of uh, ontolo ontological compromises you you are assuming to make science? Uh, okay, you 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 can uh, take it for granted that science is based only in a naturalistic ontology, but so you are excluding history. So you are excluding history from science, and then we have a kind of absurd position because science de develops. Uh, retaking, reusing, taking into account his own history. Uh, and so uh, your epistemology, your exam of epistemology in Freud, uh, put Freud in, in, uh, in the scene of epistemology again. Uh, but in your text, reading it uh, line by line, you do not uh, address the ontological question directly. So I'm doing it now. What do you think about uh, you as a Derridarian, uh, you as, uh, uh, of course, uh, reader of Lacan? How do you think uh, after your book we can or we should reconsider the difference between ontology or the connections between ontology and uh, epistemology? So I'm very Glad to read your book. Uh, very pleased to be with you again uh, to discuss your ideas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, so, um, many questions. I'll start maybe uh, with um, one thing that you said and a question that was probably related to this uh, statement. When you say that um, the clinical, that I distinguish the clinical from the pedagogical styles or genres, and that um, at, at some point the distinction dissolves. I totally agree with this. I think one instance of this is clearly manifest or manifests itself in Moses, which both is a clinical and pedagogical and not, and of course, um, historical text in a sense where the different genres are all mixed in one text that Freud wrote and rewrote many times but especially when it comes to the part called analogy I think the clinical overlaps the historical and uh, the pedagogical so I think you're absolutely right I think there are many genres and that the the in Freud in a sense Freud's testament Moses is 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 a is a text of many genres, um, and this is probably also why it's so difficult to read, and why so many even analysts will say, "Well, Freud is fantastic, except for Yinsides and Moses," except that those two texts are the texts in a sense that I'm most interested in because texts either at the limit of Freud's writing for Yinsides, the speculation, or texts that in a sense incorporate many genres at a time where Freud's analytic gesture is really at its best, also at the most intense, um, in a sense, um, level of, of experience and performance. Uh, but just to say that I totally agree with the dissolution of these um, barriers, of these borders between genres. Now, to come to your second question, or what I took to be your first or second, I mean, real question in a sense, a real address or point of discussion, uh, Freud is a bad Kantian? Yes. I mean, no problem with this. Freud wants to be a bad philosopher anyway. And like Derrida very justly said, Freud does all he can to, to avoid, this is Derrida's word, philosophy. So absolutely, he's a bad Kantian for the very good reason that I'm not sure he ever read, Freud, uh, ever read Kant in the text. And But my use of Kant is, should I say, probably limited to the first critique and especially and maybe the third actually but um what i mean by this is that um um there there is some form of nachträglichkeit to take up your concept of kant in freud at least that's how i tend to see it 
So I don't think Freud ever wanted to be Kantian. And he, if he's a bad Kantian, I could probably, um, I mean, say he's a much more good Nietzschean without wanting to be one than he's a bad Kantian. So I totally agree with you. But then I think the, the, the two aspects that I was interested in is first, um, um, Freud's distinction between noumen and phenomenon is still present in Freud, even though elusively present, but present. If he comes up with this epistemological compromise, it's also because he knows that he cannot come up with a thesis of the unconscious without treating the unconscious, without not treating the unconscious as ding. And it's a problem. You don't found a science on, on an, a new man, right? So this Freud knew, even though he was a reader of readers of Kant, he probably never addressed Kant in the first place. Okay. And then what I found Kant interesting for, as far as the reading of Freud is concerned, is that Kant, Kant of course, has, has um, uh, this idea of schematicism. And schematicism is yet this third term where imagination, of course, is so central. And this, I think, is my version of what I call fiction in Freud. This necessary third term to, um, to in a sense, uh, go beyond or beneath the Spaltung in order to, to, cons to make, I mean, consist things that will never correspond, that will never coincide. The experience and the necessity of the principle that of the, of the unconscious that will make the, the unconscious manifestation manifest. And the concept or, or the notion of schematicism, I think is useful in Freud, even though Freud never used it or never even referred to it. So my, I think you're absolutely right that Freud is a bad Kantian. And I think it's all the more comical in a sense to say this, that Freud would totally agree. He would be very happy to, to have missed it. Because again, for him, Philosophy is something that should be, by all means, avoided. And now, um, your third question. I'm not sure how I can answer. I think it's a very broad, very wide, very interesting question. The the links, the connections, or uh, between Freud's ontology and epistemology. One way of answering this question as a Derridian, should I say, is that of course I'm not sure whether Freud is. I mean, Freud's theory or Freud's practice or invention of psychoanalysis should should be read from the perspective of ontology or from the perspective of ontology. That is to say that the question of being, of course, is very problematic in Freud. Not because Freud was a bad Derridian, but because, of course, Freud wanted to avoid any form of speculation, philosophical speculation on the nature of being. So I think I'm not sure, but of course, by saying this, I'm probably avoiding your question. And, and I'm not sure how to answer this question. Um, I think, of course, um, uh, Freud's epistemology, or should I say arrangement, navigation with the question of epistemology, constant navigation with this issue, because he could also have founded a model and, st and, and stick with it. But it so happens that Freud constantly navigates new path for the, 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 the representation of the unconscious in the science. And this is what, really what fascinates me. So I'm not sure how to answer your question. How, did, how can I articulate or how can one articulate epistemology and ontology in Freud? Maybe there's no answer. My only answer would be to readdress, because I find this extremely interesting and also tricky, what Freud called metapsychology, because metapsychology and Freud mocks it. He calls metapsychology in this late text that we just discussed with Nelson, Constructions, he calls metapsychology a witch. As the witch has it, he, he mocks his own construction, his own theoretical meta construction. He mocks it as pure witch. And at the same time, he absolutely needs it. There would be no psychoanalysis without metapsychology. And so I'm not sure how to answer your question, but I think that in Freud, there's both this need, should I say aspiration to a metapsychological uh, rendering of, of, of the clinical experience and a resistance, uh, even at some point, an avoidance of metapsychology that would totally obliterate the clinic. So I think this, this resistance, this tension between the need for metapsychology, even for psychoanalysis to be handed on to, to, to new 
to new people, to new analysts, this need for metapsychology to found psychoanalysis as, um, as science maybe, and this resistance to metapsychology is inseparable probably for, from the negotiation that I don't know how to formulate between, I think what I understood your question was, that is to say the relationship between ontology and epistemology. So, your, your, your answer, yes, this, this is a very broad and uh, not very defined uh, uh, question, but uh, I think the, the main problem is, is the kind of shift of vocabulary between Freud and Lacan, and uh, the use of truth as a concept in, in Freud is very strong, but the lexicus of uh, ontology is from the beginning to end in, in Lacan, so, so we have this uh, this uh, potential relation or potential difference between between them. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you. Me. Okay, actually, we have a problem now because uh, uh, actually we have no time anymore. Uh, I, would, I have a question, and there we have also I think seven questions here from the audience. No? Uh, we have to, there is two possibilities. One. As well, we can continue, but I need to get out no? because uh, then you can stay your three both. No? Because uh, I need to, to win an election and we have a, a debate <laughs> exactly now. <laughs> Sorry. So make make your question, make your question, uh, and uh, we we continue a bit uh, transmitting the questions to uh, Isabel after you you left. Okay. Oh, sorry okay. for that, but. Uh, this is until the 2nd October, we would like that. Actually, I have just a very small question. Uh, it's concer it, that concerns your, your, let's say, insistence on the uh, uh, unconscious as a hypothesis, not actually as a, te a thesis. No? Uh, something that you really what was really precise for, for the text. No? Um, I would like to ask you, uh, if, do you think that this is actually expression of the fact that the uh, unconscious is not an ontological reality, at least if we understand it, ontology uh, uh, in a positive way as a, uh, as structures of being and categorization? Uh, because uh, for, for, for Freud, well, uh, if someone something should be a thesis, should be something that it's able to be described uh, as we describe it in this in nature in nature science, no? we a kind of a certain ontological reality, and uh, unconscious is actually it's not an ontological reality at least in the sense, no? but the pragmatical reality, no? something like uh, I I cannot. Uh, I cannot forget this this Lacanian uh, phrase that when he said something like, "If some, something exists or not, this is not really important." No? Uh, we know things that does not exist and produce if effects. No? And actually, maybe in unconscious is something like that. It means uh, uh, even when you use the notion of construction as a, a, a major e example of. Uh, let's say, um, a fiction, uh, the use of fiction in psychoanalysis, uh, we, we can also uh, always said, say something like, uh, well, but constructions, it's not a question of true value. We don't ask for the true value of a, a construction. It's a question of a pragmatical effects. Uh, if you are able, let's say, to produce some, some new associations, then the construction is it's it's a, a relevant one, no? and then uh, I, I, my my question would be: You don't think that this is really the expression as some some clinical uh, clinics as psychoanalysis or even some human science? Because it's a problem of human science at all. I I, I, I think so. Uh, are are um, uh, are dependent of uh, a type of, of of concept that is not exactly ontological concepts, but it's uh, it's pragmatical, uh, uh, let's say, skills uh, uh, for intervention. Absolutely. I thank you for this question also because it help it helps me uh, also um, proceed um, and and address also the question of fiction and the humanities because I think you're absolutely right. Um, what is at the core of Freud's in a sense epistemology is the question of, of evidence, of, of, of the proof in a sense. How can you prove the unconscious right? That's the, 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 that's the, the main problem. And you're right. In a sense, the, the unconscious 
to some extent can be read as a pragmatic principle. That's why you don't have to believe in the unconscious. Like you would believe in God if you're a Christian, if you're a Jew, if you're a Muslim. You don't have to believe because there's no, there's no object of belief there. It's only a pragmatic principle that accounts for a causality that cannot be phenomenologic, I mean, phen phenomenally showed in a sense. It's there, but because of this interruption of the Spaltung, it, the causality is logical, it's inferable, but it cannot, um, it cannot be uh, shown, it can only be inferred. And so I totally take your, your suggestion that it's, I would even rephrase the, the principle as pragmatic principle. It's, a, it's a necessary to come up with a pragmatic principle to name, in a sense, a, a causal relationship between, um, and this is very true in the Wolfman, uh, the, the dream and then the interpretation of the dream. Of course, it goes to, it pushes the limit beyond what is imaginable, even for analysts, I guess. But it's really, it, it's necessary to have a hypothesis or, or a principle of the unconscious, pragmatically, to, in a sense, to be able to relate things that remain otherwise totally, I mean, separated in a sense. And I think you're right. I think probably in the, in the humanities, in the human sciences, there is no such thing as, as thesis, at least not ontological thesis as that would be in physics or chemistry. You're absolutely right. Um, so, so, so yes, I think just to, to finish, I think um, one word that I should have used um, earlier is the, is the or concept, notion, is the notion of psychic or psychical reality. Because this is really fiction, <laughs> just like you described it. In psychical reality, if I, if I remember having been ad abused by my father, whether this was true or only my experience is indifferent, it's there. You see, it's fiction. It's, it's, and, and psychic reality is really the core of Freud's discovery in a sense, that there is no lie in hysteria. And even what, what we may understand to be a lie is, in a sense, a construction, a psychic construction of importance that has its own truth. And this, of course, undermines the very concept of ontological truth. Um, and I think the, the, so the, the turning point, the pivotal point for Freud is really this notion of psychic reality. Of course, that he, he comes up with after having relinquished his neurotica, but not for any reason, because it's in a science fiction, I mean, this construction um, of, of the of the nanic trace is really at the core of what he calls the psyche and doesn't have to, to coincide with any form of material reality. So fiction is necessary because what is what he calls truth, even though he doesn't use the word that often, has to do with has nothing to do with material reality but that with some form of experience that may, is, may be totally different and is usually totally distinct from material reality. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much. That's the thing. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. <laughs> Isabel, I, I think I uh, would will read the questions uh, to you. And uh, you can make a mix or choose this or that question to answer, okay. and then we 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 close. Nelson can can make a commentary as well. Uh, let's go. Paulo Beer uh, uh, ask uh, Isabel Stengers discusses the separation between science and fiction as a result of a demarc uh, demarcationists. A reference to Popper, uh, intent that doesn't hold from an epistemological or methodological point of view. Uh, do you think that Freud somehow anticipates that discussion by not re retreating in face of the difficulty, the, the difficulty of sweeting psychoanalysis uh, to the scientific canon of his time? Uh, let's put this, uh, read the second question uh, from Gabriel Gabeira. A question to Isabel. 
would you say that this paradigm, rehabilitation of fiction, is inherited from your relation to Jacques Derrida philosophy? I'm going to read all the questions, okay? Uh, a question from Geronimo Orestein. Maybe we can think about a middle term between noumenon and phenomenon, a non-deterministic legislated area, thinking in a kind of a Hegelian way. I wonder if Freud could be thinking this way. Just one more. Uh, Luana Marquez. Exi there exists a relation uh, uh, between this ambiguous position of Freud about the unconscious and a psychoanalysis in, uh, a, 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 as a science and the social theories uh, that uh, are being constructed uh, at, the, at that particular time uh, with uh, similar paradoxes, for example, Durkheim, Emil Durkheim. Okay. Uh, Sorry, there are many questions. No. And I'm not <laughs> so, sure if I can answer them all, but I'll try. I'll try to, try uh, to pick, do up, your... yeah, pick up on what I, I understand. Yeah, or what, what, what you want, uh, as far as so, you want. So first question, uh, is my own take of fiction derived, inherited from my reading of Jacques Derrida? Uh, maybe. Maybe that's an unconscious, uh, I mean, uh, it's an unconscious uh, event in me or unconscious uh, thing happening. I I'm not sure. I'm not sure if Derrida really comes up with a, a, a concept of fiction that I find extremely useful in this case. Uh, so I'm not sure. But maybe, maybe without realizing it, I am using Derrida. Um, to, um, um, to uh, answer the final question, because I think it's a very interesting question, whether this question of construction is, could not also be related to Durkheim's and, and, and I mean, theory and, and sociology. I think there is a, I'm not sure how to answer this question very, um, um, very briefly, but I think there, there is a lot in common between psychoanalysis and sociology, by the way. I think there certainly are lots of things in common. One thing is that they were born almost at the very same time. And the question of the social fact, of the psychic fact as construct fact, I think is true, in, is, is, is valid in both uh, disciplines. So I think there's a lot in common. And I think this question of construction and constructivism is absolutely at the core, I mean, of Freud's own take on fiction and also is, is crucial to the very foundation of psychoanalysis. And this is also true in the, in the beginnings of, of sociology. So yes, um, and by the way, the status of the proof in sociology is as difficult to make as it is in psychoanalysis. And it's not just a mere coincidence. Even though sociology is looking at something bigger, the community, society, even though Freud was himself addressing also both the individual and society, I think there is a lot in common. And also the fact that these two sciences were uh, born at the same time and the only two new sciences that were born to the 20th century is also to be probably looked at in more detail. So yes, I think this question of construction between sociology and psychoanalysis is definitely um, important. Um, to answer the um, 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 Hegelian question or to question this midterm, the, 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 the notion that I come up with, this midterm halfway between the two halves of the Spaltung, um, I think the only problem with uh, this um, suggestion, very, uh, very apt suggestion of a non-deterministic area, legislated area for Freud, is that, and maybe that's why Freud is both a bad Kantian but not a Hegelian at all, is that Freud wants to make, um, wants to come up with, an, um, with a concept of causality. So the problem in Freud is determination, especially. I mean, exactly, is this question of determination. So this, I mean, this midterm needs to make it possible for a certain determination to be established. That's why I, I, I wouldn't um, say that there is this possibility of a non-deterministic non legislated area even though it's a very interesting suggestion, but I don't think it would work because precisely fiction for Freud is, if there is anything like fiction, 
what I call fiction in Freud, this mid, I mean, half this term halfway between the terms or this midterm is by, by definition, not fiction in the pure imaginative sense, but fiction in, in, in the um, Kantian imagination related sense. That is to say, make a case, uh, allow for a certain non phenomenal causality to be established. Um, and then, um, and then I'm not sure if I got one question, one early question, right? A question having to do with the scientific canon of his time. I'm not sure if I got the question right. Was the question, did Freud come up with his own theory? Because he wanted to compete with the theories, the, the, is, I'm not sure I got the question right. Uh, you can put the stingers again? Uh, it's... Uh, 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 it's Isabel not this Stengers one. discusses Why? the separation between science and fiction as the result of a demarcationist intent that doesn't hold from an uh, epistemological or methodological point of view. Yes. Uh, do you think that Freud somehow anticipates that discussion by not retreating in the face of difficulty, difficulty of suiting psychoanalysis to the scientific canon of his time? I'm not sure. I'm still not sure I understand the question. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, I've read Isabel Stenger's. I, I think, I mean, it's a statement. I don't, I don't see how I could say, I mean, I agree with the statement. Now, mm -hmm. when it comes to the, to the relationship between Freud and the science of his time, I think it's a, it's a capital subject. It's a big subject, of course, because I think what I called an epistemological compromise also belongs to Freud's own competition with the science of his time. He was a major reader of the science of his time. I was struck to realize that um, when working on the concept of hypothesis, that in 1911, I think, Poincaré came up, the French um, mathematician, mm -hmm. came up with a book called L'Hypothèse and devoted a long book of reflection on the question of hypothesis. So it's not by any, I mean, it's, it's, it's by no means a coincidence, I think, that Freud should come up with the concept of hypothesis. Of course, he needs it, but it's also, um, and of course, I'm not a historian of sciences, but it also belongs to, um, to a certain moment in time. And in, 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 it certainly belongs also to the debates. I mean, this notion of hypothesis also belongs to the debates of his scientific time. So, and again, this is what is so striking and fascinating about Freud is that he seems to come up with a theory of his own, totally disconnected from the rest of sciences. And at the same time, it's not the case at all. It's totally, it's totally in echo, a line in a sense, echoing social, the invention of sociology, the foundation of sociology, but also certain very, um, 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 I mean, very serious scientific debates like the debate around about hypothesis. Nelson, would you like to make a, a final comment? Yes, yes. It, it has been a delicious discussion. And many, many ideas had, has, have uh, spring out of my, in my mind. Um, I'm not sure I would like to, to ask you about. It's Michel Foucault's, Michel Foucault and his book, Les Moules Shoes, The Words and the Things, where um, by the end of this book, he points out a, a great abyss. Uh, humanities have, uh, have testified uh, a great abyss that opened, that opened in, precisely in their scientific aspirations as, as natural sciences. And I, has, I have always looked at this, this final chapter, the chapter where Foucault puts out this phenomena, this, 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 this evenement, uh, as a, a crisis, but also as opportunity. <laughs> goes even to call Freud and linguistics 
les contre-sciences, les gains sciences. So, um, this is very interesting. I would like to hear you about a little bit about this, this confrontation of lectures, of readings, confrontation of readings. You, Christian has just put something out very precise, I like very much, this distinction between epistemology and ontology. Uh, it's a, a cherished team also put out by Barbara Cassin. She presents this concept, Novalis concept, logology, logology. It's a, a third way to, to, to address this question. But Foucault, I think, it's interesting. It, it's very interesting because he keeps the abyss open. He keeps it open. Well, it's a, a stimulus. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Just, I'm fascinated by the the end of Les Mots et les Choses, and of course, this regist. I mean, um, Foucault registering or heralding what he calls the end of man, la fin de l'homme. Because this, I mean, the, the, the entire book finishes on these two, three words, very enigmatic words related to a, a reference to Nietzsche, if, as me, if my memory is correct, a little earlier yes. at the end of the chapter. I had never thought of this before. I've, I've, I've oftentimes uh, read these pages and um, um, I've never thought of this before, but in a sense, your question leads me to just um, think that it's, it's, of course, and this also echoes uh, Lacan, it's unclear whether psychoanalysis can be treated as une science de l'homme to that extent. Uh, maybe psychoanalysis also has to do with la fin de l'homme, at least some construct of mankind, of humanity, certainly, related to the, the agency of, of, of consciousness, but not only that. So, I've never thought of, of you know, of, 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 of this before, but, and I'm not sure whether it's a, it's a very apt answer, but certainly uh, Freud undermines the, the, the very concept of humanity or of mankind. And, and this could echo Foucault's very strong statement, enigmatic statement that c'est la fin de l'homme. Maybe psychoanalysis also has to do with this, with la fin de l'homme. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much to you too and to the public. Thank you so much. So uh, let's end our conversation. I uh, will express uh, my, all my thanks to uh, Isabel, Nelson, all the people who are with us in this discussion. Uh, lembrando, o livro da Isabela Alfandri acabou de ser publicado pela editora Blucher. É, Ciência e Ficção em Freud, recomendamos para todos os interessados é, a leitura, é um livro muito importante, é, chegando agora em português. Né? So, Merci let's beaucoup. see you later. Bye. 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 Many Thank thanks. You. Many thanks. Nelson, você espera um pouquinho?